Hey, welcome to Whatcha Doin' with Brandon Horwin and Sophie Williams. And today's special guest is... Well, my name is Judy K. That's my professional name and my birth name. And uh, that's kind of what people call me. Um, although there are a lot of people through the years who called me Judy K. What? When I would say my name is Judy K, they say Judy K. What? Mm -hmm. uh, I started my life in Phoenix, Arizona, and I went off to UCLA and California, and I have been doing what I do. I got my Actors Equity card in 1967. You do the math. <laughs> yeah, and I was still a student then. I was like, that was right after my freshman year of college. So, um, yeah, I'm an actor. <laughs> Welcome, Judy, to What You Do, and we're thrilled to be with you here today. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. <laughs> so can you um, tell us a little bit about your journey to theater and sort of how you got your start and where the roads, you know, took you to end up where you are today? Well, it's a long journey, as you can tell. I mean, it's 50 plus years of doing this, and I'm... I, shocked and amazed and a little embarrassed to say that I've never done anything else but what I do. I've managed to pay my rent and then my mortgage and all my bills and, and live a life uh, happily being a working actor. And that's all I ever wanted was to be a working actor. And I got my, my wish pretty early on. Uh, well, things were cheaper then although everything is relative, I guess, but I, I started, as I said, in, in, uh, Arizona and I did some um, recording there actually. The first time I ever worked, worked and got paid for it, I sang jingles and things for the radio because I could read pretty well. Uh, and I, was, I, I learned how to work in a you know, studio and, and uh, that, was, that was a great beginning actually. And then I went off to UCLA and had a a blast there and because I was in Los Angeles decided you know I actually I, it hadn't occurred to me or if it had occurred to me it was just this little dream way back in in the in my somewhere in the recesses of my pea brain that I might actually have a have a career in show business of some sort and and then I got scared and I thought no maybe I better just be a teacher I'll be a teacher. Like, that's a just, that's a terrible thing to say. I don't mean just. As it turned out, I was a rotten teacher. I, I studied at UCLA creative dramatics and tried to teach, work with little kids and stuff. And I'm too much of a, uh, you know, class clown. And um, my ego, I guess, is too big. I, I, I realized that I wasn't meant to guide young minds into the world of theatrics or life or whatever. What I'm meant to do is get up and tell stories and uh, not necessarily be the center of attention, but be in that, in the room where it happens, you know, here we go. Uh, so I uh, started going out on auditions. I got the trade papers, you know, at, uh, Daily Variety and, and the reporter and, and backstage and all that stuff that existed in the day. And I started going on open calls, just open auditions. And pretty early on, I got a job and I got my equity card doing um, a chorus in, a, in a, a stock theater. They used to have a thing called winter stock there uh, where you would, it would function very much like summer stock, but it was in the winter. And uh, there was a theater, there was a, a theater in the round. That was the thing then. They were building all over the West. They were building these huge theaters in the round. And there was one in my hometown in Phoenix where I got to go as an audience. And I almost worked, but uh, that's another story. I'll put that in the novel or the book, the memoir or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then I, I, I had the one car in my dorm of a, of a group of friends and we drove out to... Uh, Anaheim, California, where there was this theater in the round called Melody Land. And uh, I got a job. I got a job in the chorus and did three, four shows, four shows, um, half a sixpence, Camelot, South Pacific. I think that was it, three shows. And kind of decided that I wasn't really cut out to be in the chorus. I wasn't good enough, frankly. I, you got to, and now you have to be even better than you were then. 
Uh, you have to know how to do so many things to be in the ensemble of a show. Uh, I, I figure if I were starting now, I probably couldn't get arrested, but, uh, but maybe I would, I would knuckle down and learn all those other things like acrobatics that I would have to have, you know, how, how to do a backflip and sing a high D natural. So um, anyway, so I went, I was at UCLA, I got this job and then that led to another job. I went on another open call for You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown in Los Angeles, which was a really big deal when that show opened because there weren't that many sit down professional shows playing in LA. It was, it was all about television and movies and, and the actors there, and they still are like this. They, they do basically work for free in the theater just to keep you know, the instrument going and uh but at that time i got that job and i did that for two years which was astonishing and then that led to uh you know i got the agent and i started going on all the other auditions and i got a little television work and a lot of commercial work which paid the bills commercials paid the bills and then i toured all over the place and that led me finally to get to new york where I auditioned for a show called On the 20th Century. Uh, I had a, a sort of a history with Hal Prince uh, auditioning when he'd come to LA for some things and he hadn't hired me yet. We'd almost worked together once on the Candide that he had on Broadway, but that's another bunch of stories. That's another book, uh, why that didn't work out. But then, then he offered me the understudy for Madeline Kahn in the show On the 20th Century. And that led to, uh, well, we, I did it for a year on Broadway, but uh, nine, nine weeks, five, five weeks into the run, five weeks into the run, I, I was given the role. Madeline left and I, they gave it to me. So that was like crazy. Just that's, yes, another book. Um, <laughs> And that, that was sort of my coming out party in New York. And I, and I was able to get, you know, go from job to job. And I've been doing that for lo these many years. I'm a lucky, lucky kid. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good, but, I'm, but I'm, I'm pretty damn lucky too. Yeah, you just spoke about um, filling in for Madeline Kahn and taking over for her. So what was that like, you know, as a young artist kind of stepping into the shoes of such an established performer? She was pretty young too, and I was a huge fan of hers. Uh, as a matter of fact, sidebar, uh, when I was in LA, still, you know, trying, working it out and had, doing theater here and there and a bit of television, a little of this, a little of that. I was up at a supermarket called Ralph's up on Sunset Boulevard one day, and, uh, and I'm pushing my cart around, and who's there pushing her cart? But Madeline Kahn, and this was years before we ever met. And, uh, and I, something in me just, this happens to me, it just wow, it got into my, into my brain that I would, I pulled my cart right in front of her and scared the hell out of the poor woman. I mean, she thought, oh my God, a stalker. And, and I just said, welcome to LA. I, I had seen her on the Tonight Show because she was astonishingly talented and somehow she'd caught the, uh, the eye of some of the casting people, you know, and, and her, her star was really, really rising. And I just said, you're fabulous. You're wonderful. Have a great time. She hadn't even done any movies yet. And I said, <laughs> I'm so excited for you. You're just, you keep it up. Anyway, years later, uh, I found myself as her understudy, uh, a job I turned down a few times because I had already been an understudy at UCLA and I really realized I was not cut out for that job either. That's, that's, a, that's the hardest, being a swing is the very hardest thing in the theater where you learn a bunch of parts. Being an understudy is, it's, it's hard work, it's really hard work and it's hard on the soul. It's very, you play, you have to play this little game with yourself, which is now I'm never going on. I'm, I'm never going on in this part. I will never ever go on. And I will never get to do this role anywhere, anytime. But if I do, I'm going to be so prepared. <laughs> and I have to, I have to believe that, I, that the job is mine in order for me to get up and do it properly. I mean, especially the role in 20th century. Because that's, you know, it's, it was, I had to somehow believe that I was this great 
star or it, it couldn't have worked. So um, she was, she was, uh, couldn't have been more generous and dear. Um, you know, it, it didn't work out for her. She, she left, she went on to her other greater glory. And I was just, I was lucky. I had gone on for her a few times, nine times. What am I saying? Nine times in five weeks in the very beginning of the run. And uh, I got noticed. I was doing my job and, and, I, and I was noticed. So it was, uh, it was exciting. It was incredible. I mean, it, it, this happened to me twice in my life where I, this incredible thing happens and then I'm on the subway and I see the front page of God Help Me, the New York Post, which <laughs> is the worst rag in the world, but it wasn't so bad then. It was just, you know, but it was on the floor. People were standing on my face in the subway. <laughs> so that, that's, that's a wake up call right there. You know, it's, if you want to find out what real is, that's, that's real. Yeah. So uh, shortly thereafter, you moved on to a short lived uh, revenue, uh, the Mooney Shapiro show in 1981, which lasted for about 15 previews and one performance. But then you uh, booked Phantom and won your first Tony. So can you speak a bit to the perseverance required um, of performers looking to make it in the business? Perseverance, it's all about that. I mean, yeah, yeah you wouldn't be doing it if you weren't talented, I would hope. I mean, sometimes I think, <laughs> well, well, you know, I go back to that first audition out at uh, Metal Melody Land Theater. Uh, we were all auditioning for these little, these chorus jobs. And there was a, I saw a woman and we were all in the room together. We were in the theater and we were watching each other's auditions and they were, you know, we did 16 bars of, of any song you wanted. And there was a woman who was in probably in her fifties. She looked very old to me. Of course I was, you know, 21, not even, what am I saying? I was 19, 18. And, uh, she had on her basic black dress, maybe the only one in her closet, little some pearls and her dyed hair. And she was, had a dream. She was terrible. She, her audition was, she was so scared and she really, she wanted it, but she didn't have it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't in the cards. And I sat there thinking, oh my God, what am I getting myself into here? Mm -hmm. This is a disease. This isn't a job. This isn't a career. This is a disease. I mean, what if I have, what if I really have no talent and I'm still uh, trying to do this? Um, but I, as I said, I, I was good, but I, and I got lucky. I got lucky. I mean, there were a lot of other people in that room and they were very good too. So, so perseverance, uh, it's kind of everything because there's good times and there's bad times, good times, bum times. I've seen them all. <laughs> and I'm still here. And that's, that is about perseverance. It's about, I'm going to, I'm going to let the, the bad comments roll right off me. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to believe in myself. I'm, and, and some people take that all the way to arrogance. Uh, I think that's misplaced. I don't think that's helpful. Um, but self-belief and, you know, if you don't try, you'll never find out if you could have done it, you know? Yeah. So, um, and, and, and the, I'm very fortunate, as I said, I never had to take another job, but I would have, I don't think I would have waited tables because I think if somebody gave me, you know, stuff, I would have, I would probably have given them a right cross. You know, <laughs> if somebody gave me a hard time in the restaurant, I, I, I would not have been able to put up with the stuff people put up with. And women don't put up with that stuff now so much, I hope, but in the day, it could be pretty terrible. And I, I, I wasn't about to, I didn't cotton to that. So, um, but I, but I, I had, I had belief. I just had belief that I, that I, everything was going to work out. And I had great parents too. Parents who, who said, yeah, you know, we believe in you too. And, and that's very important. And I know a lot of young actors who, then, at least in my circle, did not have that. That was really hard. Yeah. So you originated the role of Rosie in Mamma Mia on Broadway, you know, a show Broadway. Yeah. so huge. Um, so what was it like, you know, working with 
members of ABBA to create this like huge musical theater phenomenon. Well, now you got to know that the show had been done in London and hugely yeah. successful. It had already been created. And our job in, in point of fact was to not, I felt, not to do the performances that had already been done in, in mm -hmm. uh, London, to bring ourselves to it, you know, to put it into, the, into America, bring it here. Uh, and we met Abba, we met the guys to, you know, and they came and uh, saw us, but we didn't really work with them. We didn't mm -hmm. get to work with them, but it was fun being in that show. We called that the uh, menopausal cash cow, uh, <laughs> women of a certain age, getting to jump up and down and play on, st on stage and be silly. And, you know, I hadn't had a chance to do a role like that since Charlie Brown and, and Greece. I did Greece, you know, and for a couple of years uh, on the road back. That was my, that was actually the first job I got out of New York. Came to New York, got the job and went out on the road. And eventually then when it stepped in for a, a summer on Broadway, that was before 20th century, but it had that sort of same kind of feel of, it's really fun, but it's really hard work and you really have to bring it. If you don't bring all the energy eight times a week, you don't bring the show, you know? So yeah. it was fun. It was great fun. It was, we had a blast. Yeah, that's great. So another, you also orig originated the role of Carlotta in Andrew Lloyd Webber and Hal Prince's masterpiece, Phantom of the Opera. Can you take us through your experience of crafting this role and working with that original Broadway cast and creative team? Well, of course, that's another instance where the show had been created in London, right? So they had a they had a huge success with it. Now, and we had Michael Crawford and we had Sarah Brightman in that company and wonderful Steve Barton, who we've lost. But uh, it was, uh, there was a certain amount of constraint on that because it, it it was massive and they wanted it just a certain way. And that isn't as much fun to me. There's not, there's, it was very, very structured. Uh, and I, I love Hal. Hal was uh, a mentor and uh, I owe pretty much everything good in my career to him. So when he asked me to do that, I was, I was thrilled to do it. And, uh, and it was, it was an amazing experience being part of a juggernaut like that. And, and Mamma Mia was like that too. These are massive money makers. And being part of something like that is totally different than crafting from, you know, the beginning, which is what I have done most recently, crafting from the beginning, uh, really from the beginning. But we'll go into that probably later on in the conversation. Uh, it was, it was uh, every, you know, every experience is extraordinary, you know, especially in this business because you're working so closely with other human beings. So, so we, you make friendships that last through the years and, uh, and you're, you're making magic every night, eight times a week on Broadway. And I will never, you know, any, anything you hear about Broadway is true, uh, the good stuff. It's amazing to be in a place like that. I'm sure the West End is not dissimilar, but even people who come from Britain and are on Broadway, they say, this is, this is different than it is, you know, cause it's sort of a lunch bucket attitude in, in Britain. They've been doing it so long, but the magic of the whole thing is never, is never lost on Americans when we do this. We love it. Absolutely. And going off of that, the magic of Broadway, you have won two Tony Awards for Phantom yeah. of the Opera and nice work if you can get it. What were the, you know, what were those moments like for you, you know, receiving Broadway's highest honor those nights? Pretty heady stuff. Uh, to stand up in front of an audience full of I guess your peers, most of them, I mean, there are, most of them are people like you. In fact, they're all people like you. They put their pants on one leg at a time, right? But they're the creme de la creme are right in front of you. And you just stand there and breathe that in. And, uh, and then 
in the moment you have no idea whether you're you're really saying everything that you really want to say and thanking the people you really want to thank and um it's it's pretty heady it's uh it's takes your breath away it really does i for me both times truly truly and i don't i'm in a place right now where i don't have them here so uh, <laughs> i can't even show them to you and they're two different sizes the old ones were shorter and they're big and tall now uh but they they all of them turn <laughs> <laughs> and i could wear them as ear bobs but i would have to i would be walking <laughs> sort of <laughs> they're heavy <laughs> actually the bet the bet the kind of the niftiest award is the theater world award that's a beautiful thing do you know about the theater world award that's for your basically your first big thing on, on in new york oh. and it and it was it it was initially given to decide on by one guy um john i can't remember his last name that's that's not good he's gone now but he the the it was a there was a book every year that came out called theater world i don't know if it still is and uh they gave an award and it was an extraordinarily beautiful award and it's it's uh it's quite a collection of humanity if you google that and see what that is i that was that's that's a that's a beautiful thing but the, the tony the parties dressing up yeah. and now they they do sort of like they used they do with uh, the academy awards you can go and borrow the jewelry from uh uh you know winston and uh and all these and the dresses and the, uh, it's fun it's fun yeah so looking ahead you were set to open uh diana the musical as queen elizabeth right when covid kind of hit so what was it like from an actor's perspective creating a show about uh the royals and just navigating kind of the uncharted waters of, of uh filming and doing a live capture during COVID. Oh, this, this, the, the doing the filming was, was really cool. Um, first of all, being sent home from rehearsal because of this terrible thing um, was new terror, new territory for me. I've been through a lot. I've been through 9-11. I was doing Mamma Mia. Uh, we were opening Mamma Mia. We were the first show that opened after 9-11. So that was extraordinary and awful. And, uh, and there have been blackouts. I mean, I was on stage doing Grease on Broadway when there was a blackout. And we finished the show with flashlights and, and the emergency generator in the, in the back of the house. Um, but a pandemic, that's a new one. Um, and being sent home and not getting to do what we do for all this time, you know, uh, March 12th will be a year since we were sent home. Um, you know, trying to keep a, a, a positive attitude. Our, our, um, the show is wonderful and it was still being created. Um, we had done six preview performances and we were working in the daytime, putting in rewrites that's what you do. You run the show at night and you uh, rehearse it in the daytime. And then you, you know, when everybody's secure enough, you pop the new, the new material in. You've also had to tech it. And uh, we were, we were in the thick of that, but we all knew something was going on. And the night before, was it the night before this happened or the Monday night before this happened was the Moulin Rouge cast night off and they all came to see us and most of them got sick so we mingled with them and we probably i mean i might have had it i don't even know i sometimes i think i did but uh and then to be sent home um we didn't know how long it was going to last trying to keep a good attitude trying not to get let it get us down and then our but our producers were amazing so they really were still working and being extremely positive as they still are and we we did some work sessions like this on zoom and uh that was interesting but we were able to do put in all the work that they had wanted to do in those that month of preview so in, in point of fact the show is pretty much done i think 
we might have figured out a couple other things, little things that they're going to be able to fix. But um, and then they came to us and said, "We're going to film this." And it wasn't. It's not really a capture because there's no audience. We did not just run it. We did it like a movie. We did it. In, we we ran it a couple of times, but even so, we still had to stop because of certain technical things that had to happen. And uh, and then we we were there for four days with nine cameras all over the place. And we were living in a bubble for a month, a month with all of our tech and the film crew and everything. Uh, and it's going to get out here. I think it, now we're told something like maybe April, I think. You know, we are, we're all at the whims of Netflix now. But that was, that was for me, that was pretty thrilling doing that. Uh, so I'm excited and I'm scared all at once. Just because I don't usually like to look at myself. I don't like to look at myself at all. But, uh, but I'm really glad the show is, is, has been, yes, captured for all e eternity now. And uh, as soon as we can, we're going to go back to work. You know, we're going to get back up on a stage and do this thing live. And, and it's thrilling. It's a great part that I have. Jody Pietro wrote me just a wonderful, wonderful character. And the show is covers uh, the worst, the worst marriage, public marriage that ever happened, probably right up there. Could only only happen with the royals. This kind of a mess, but um, the cast is great, and uh, of course, I love every one of them. I'm the kind of the the ancient of the group, but uh, it's I can't wait to do it again. You know, and we can't and wait we, to see it. <laughs> yeah, the, I got I. You know, after after stopping the way we did, and thinking, oh well, I don't know when I'm going to get to do this again. To then getting the call, we're going to make a movie, and getting back to work on this thing, and working on all the the rewrites and seeing what the vision was that they have been trying to get it to, and so exciting. And then being able to get back in my beautiful costumes, oh. You know, it's the little things back mm -hmm. in my dressing. All my stuff is still in my dressing room. I, I did not empty it. I'm going back there to work. As soon as they let me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you had, you've had some great replacement roles that you've done on Broadway, um, some including the Dower Empress in Anastasia, uh, mm -hmm. Madame Morrible and Wicked, Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney Todd in 2005. That's to name a few. Um, what would you say your biggest challenge was stepping into a role um, as a replacement for that particular role? And you know, which one was the most challenging for you personally? Would you say? So interesting. I've done it a lot, not by design, but that you know you want to work right, and you want to, You don't want to screw everybody in the cast up, so you have to you know do your job as an understudy with an awareness of what the show is, but you also are yourself. So um, luckily the role, Morrible stands on its own. It's, it's, you're not, people aren't so terribly dependent on you uh, to be able to continue what they've been doing and creating their roles. Um, let's see. Uh, I did go into Greece on Broadway. That was, that was, everybody was very available, if you will, to whatever someone was going to bring to the party at that point. So that was fine. And then uh, what was the other ones? Let's see, you, you mentioned, oh, oh, uh, Anastasia. I loved, loved doing that too. Um, that was just beautiful to be part of. And I had played Anastasia herself in a show years and years and years ago. Uh, another piece about her so it was really marvelous kind of getting to play the dowager uh, in, a, in a somewhat altered version of the same story so that was cool and if, weirdly enough I had done Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney Todd a bunch I mean I can do it in my sleep uh, I love it so much it's what it's probably arguably my favorite role that I've ever done and arguably the fa my favorite role I've ever seen anybody do I just love the, the piece and I love 
her. <laughs> um, but going into that production, that production, that, that John Doyle, pick up your tuba production, was scared the living daylights out of me. I remember the first time I went on on Broadway, Patty was off doing, I think she was doing Gypsy. And uh, <laughs> I'm standing there with my triangle and I'm thinking, is there a way to get off this stage? Can I just leave now? <laughs> I mean, I, it wasn't the show, it wasn't, it wasn't the piece, it wasn't uh, the role. God knows, I mean, I, like I said, I know it so well, but I was so sure I was gonna screw somebody else up with my bad you know, triangle playing and my awful tuba and, and, the, and the, the glockenspiel I was playing. I'm sure I just, I just knew that I was gonna destroy someone else's performance by my bad accompaniment. You know, that's not, that's not, my, that's not my strong suit. That's not my, where I, you know, where I live. So, and, and I had also, I had very little time to learn the blocking and the, and get it up on its feet. And it was scary with ladders to climb and, and I'm in high heels, you know, and I thought, ah, oh, this, is, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Cut to the fact that I had one of the best times of my life doing it, of course. And I went out on the road with it for almost a year and did it and uh, loved it, just loved it. Yeah, more on uh, the idea of like your role. I, I find it interesting that, you know, we've talked about so many of your different roles. You've done uh, Rosie and Mamma Mia, Carlotta in uh, Phantom of the Opera, Mrs. Lovett, Queen Elizabeth. Um, so how have you managed then to interpret such a wide variety of roles and not kind of be pigeonholed into a certain type? It's not easy because uh, this business wants to uh, do that. I was very good at playing hysterical people. And that's for a while, that's what I was getting off of was hysterical people. And I had to turn a bunch of jobs down. I didn't want to play hysterical people all the time. Um, I like to play characters that change, that, you know, learn something in the, in the course of the story and, and change. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I've been lucky. I, a lot of it, I think, has to do with... Uh, the vocal demands of these roles, maybe that they thought that I vocally could handle. I mean, like um, playing Emma Goldman in Ragtime. You know, that was that was. I I had the I guess the gravitas or something that I could play that, and I also had the low notes, you know, but I also had the high notes for Carlotta. You know, I had the extension at least at that time. I don't have it anymore. But I had it then, yeah. Uh, it just, it's, it's, it's so much of its luck. I was very lucky. They, people could see me doing different things and, uh, and I was given a chance. And I, you know, we actors, we never say no. We, know, we all believe we can do pretty much anything. And, uh, and we have to believe that. That's how you just embrace, embrace whatever the story is and whatever the character is. And, and if somebody just lets you, that's <laughs> that's up to them. That 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 I do my best to uh, get people to see that I and all actors do this to see that I, I I can do this this thing, and then they pay me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so taking that all into account, what advice do you have for young artists, students, aspiring artists, um, people about to embark into their journeys at the moment in this business? What advice do you have for them to, you know, keep on going and, and, and sort of crafting their career amidst chaos around them? Well, uh, this is a big question mark. I mean, I know how I did it. I knocked on doors and dropped off uh, bios and, and uh, you know, pictures and resumes. And I, I got the, the trade papers and went on every audition I possibly could. I think wherever, where, whatever is going on now, be it Zoom or, and most of it is, I'm sure, remote. It's all remote. And I'm not great at that, to be honest, because that's not how I, I, I mean, they look all right. 
but I don't feel real comfortable. I'd rather be in a room with somebody showing them what I do. Um, but I think you just have to figure it out. Each, each What I went through was different than what the people before me had gone through, you know? Um, so I think it's, it's going to be up to each young performer, um, artist, whatever, in whatever area of the theater they, you know, whatever they want to accomplish, they're just going to have to learn what the parameters are and how they're going to fit into that and then find their own path. Um, I don't think anybody can, can tell you how to do it now. I, 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 I know oddly enough that in this situation, I'm really glad I'm old because uh, I've, I've had 50 years of doing this and, and I've saved my, my pennies and I've, you know, I've been a pretty good businesswoman about all this thing. So my, my life is okay. But I think about the young people coming to the city of New York or anywhere, you know, and they've got their little nest egg of stuff and they get an apartment with a, a couple of people or more and they get a survival job waiting tables. It's, it's a terrible time to, to try to do this, but you know what? It's never been easy. It's never been easy. At the best of times, it wasn't easy. So I think that you just have to go to school on what is possible and figure it out, you know? Keep your ear to the ground, keep, keep learning. Don't stop learning, be a citizen of the world. I always say this to young performers, you, gotta, you really have to have more going on than just this thing. It's really important for the sake of what you do, um, for the sake of being a, a better person and performer, but also having a full life. You know, you got to be engaged and, uh, and you have to keep reading and listening and studying and, and, uh, and then just figure it out. I wish, I wish I had the magic thing. This is what you do. Okay. <laughs> but I never, I never lived through a thing like this. Uh, but every one of us had to start from zero. I did. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. So uh, you just, you just have to keep on keeping on and things are going to be opening up. I truly believe that. I think when this is, when we're all able to gather, there's going to be such a hunger for what we do. I just think it's it's going to be astonishing. Um, and if we can all kind of hold on long enough, we're we're gonna we're gonna have an amazing ride through all of this. I think our audiences are going to be bigger and happier and more grateful. And uh, and there will be and 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 there's so and there's the internet now. I mean, this is a whole, you got to understand this, this never existed for people like me. I, I had to figure out ways to show my wares. Now you just set your ring light up and your microphone. I bought one of those too, but it's terribly loud. I have to figure out how to make it work better. Um, but you, so many people are creating themselves on the internet and, and a lot of them in the theater. I mean, I've worked with some of them who were hired because they had an internet following. So, and I don't know how to do that. I don't begin to know how to do that. I'm not even interested. You know, I don't care how many followers I have, on, but uh, <laughs> I just, I just want to, you know, do my work and make, make an audience happy. And, uh, and I know I'm going to get a chance to do it again. It's may not be until next Christmas, who knows, but, but I'll be there. And so will you guys, because you, you can't, if you do this, it's not because you kind of want to, it would really be fun. Oh, it's a cool way to make a lot of money. No, it isn't that at all. It's because you have to. You have to. I had to do this. I had to have this life. I, as it turned out, once I realized that it was my path, there was nothing else I could have done, you know? So that's what, that's what this generation will, will do too. And they'll create a new new forms. And I mean, where did where did Hamilton come from? Where did Lin Manuel Miranda come from? That's 
That's astonishing. There are others like him out there. We just haven't seen him yet, right? They're all in college maybe or in grammar school. I don't know. But I, can't, I can't wait to see what they do, right? And maybe they'll give me a job. <laughs> so you've shared uh, some awesome stories from your career. Um, I'd just like to know if there is a favorite story you have that you just love to tell. Maybe it's about a person you worked with or a particular show you've worked on or someone you've <sighs> met. Wow. I would have to think about that. A favorite story. You know, I've told you some of the stories of my life that have been sort of the most, most famous, but a lot, so much happens in little exchanges. And, and when I was starting my career, I had the great good fortune to work with some of the, some of the great stars of really great stars, you know, not like me, but big people, you know, and most of them were only too willing to just sit down and just blab, you know, tell me about their lives and, and uh, say, what was it like making, you know, gone with the wind? What was it like doing this? What was it like doing that? But I, I think that's another thing that I would pass along. A lot of times I have noticed in recent history, in my recent history, working with young artists, they sort of feel like they're finished when they come out of school. And they're not finished at all. They're just starting, you know. You, you think you know everything. You don't know anything. You know nothing yet. And so just, you know, sitting and having a cup of coffee and shooting the breeze with somebody and there's, and there's always new information, new, just golden stuff to glean from, from your older uh, colleagues you know, and uh, pick their brains. And I wish I could come up with just a story right now. That would be fun. Do I have a story? I should always have a story. <laughs> I should think of a story that I have in my back pocket and say, ah, it's time for the story. Uh, I can at this moment, without wasting your time, think of exactly one, because it's all just this wonderful wash of things, you know, there's there's stories from the road. There's stories from uh, after after a show at night. There's stories from rehearsals. There's bad stories. And there's good stories. There's stories about uh, people who took themselves a little too seriously, and they weren't any fun to work with at all. People who you, you know sucked all the air out of the room instead of adding some more oxygen. But uh, all in all, it's just been a great ride, you know, the whole thing. If it ended, you know, I have to say, if it ended now and I never, you know, I, Diana didn't open and I just decided, well, you know, I think I'm going to hang up my vocal cords here and just uh, get on with my life. Uh, it would be okay. It would be okay. I've had a, so much fun and I've, and I've met such wonderful people and been so lucky enough to just be in great places. And I just wish that for everybody, you know? Um, and the way that happens is by really listening, really, really caring and uh, being really lucky, but you don't have a lot, of, a lot of control over, but you know, do, do your best to put yourself in the place where you need to be. And wherever that is now, whether it's in front of your, your a camera doing stuff on the internet, maybe that's it, but this too will pass and uh and we'll all be back in a theater or somewhere on a on a sound stage or you know dancing and singing we'll be doing it absolutely yeah. well thank you so much congratulations on your incredible career and everything you. that you're continuing to do um i just want to remind our audience that um on Netflix, possibly in April. Take a look. Well, that's at we keep keep your eye open because Netflix just says, "Okay, now it's coming out." Yeah. <laughs> that's how they work. They 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 don't give you a lot of uh, lead time, but they they've been cutting it together. They're still tinkering with the ins and outs and stuff. I've noticed. So uh, when it's ready, boom, there it'll be. And we can't wait for it. Thank you so much for your inspiration, advice, sharing your career with us, and joining us today. We had a great time. pleasure. Thank you. Me too. All the best, you guys.
Thank you so much.